Hello everyone! Welcome back to the Secrets of Calculus! Today I will talk about the chain rule, a big brain derivative rule that is so important that it comes up in some un unexpected places later on. Hang on, is this video too long for you? Here are the formulas. Yep, just one. Let me know what you did with that extra free time. So just like how I explained where the product and quotient rules came from from last episode, I'm going to start by using the limit definition of the derivative and a ton of algebra to show where this rule comes from. Let's say we have the function x squared plus 1 all that squared. Now we could just use the distributive property to simplify and then take the derivative, but what if that squared was actually to the 1000th power? Sure, the binomial theorem speeds up the expansion significantly, but I don't want to have to do that. Maybe a derivative in factored form like this is more convenient. Let's see what the limit has to say. Okay, so it looks like we're going to have to expand the squares if we're going to get anywhere with the limit. Expansion? Really? And since this is a limit, we now use convenience to say that approaching zero is not the same as equaling zero, which lets us divide by h without breaking math. And now we use convenience of limits again to now say approaching is the same as equaling, and we solve our limit. So this answer is great and all, but I kept hinting at a better way to do all this. Something that would work even if you had x squared plus 1 all that to the 1000th power. Now watch what happens when I selectively factor and simplify things to prove a point. Well, would you look at that? It's like we treated x squared plus 1 like a separate function, with the squared part being what we cared about. We took the derivative using the power rule from before, and then multiplied by the derivative of the x squared plus 1 part. And actually, that's exactly what the chain rule says to do. We can generalize this further by declaring the existence of a new variable, u equals g of x. And we're going to treat u as though it were a variable. We're going to use the top part of the derivative fraction now because it's time for some shenanigans. Remember, the full form of the derivative fraction is dy over dx since the slope, with dy being short for delta y and dx being short for delta x. What this chain rule basically amounts to is this. Now, this revelation is actually really huge. It means that if your derivative is not of the same variable as the derivative expects it to be, then like this u being the variable of f, even though the derivative expects an x, you can use u as a bridge to go between f and x. And if you wanted to engage in notation abuse, you could prove this by crossing out the du in the numerator and denominator to get the df over dx part back. But mathematicians hate it when you do that, just saying. Last episode, I alluded to the quotient rule being obsolete once we had the chain rule. This is also a perfect way to show how we can combine these rules together and, sh and use them in the same equation. So first, we have a function fraction f of x over g of x. This g of x can be rewritten as g of x to the negative 1 power, so we get f of x times g of x to the negative 1 power. Now we use the product rule. Here, we recognize an inner function slash variable u equals g of x, swallowed by an outer function u to the negative 1. We know how to take the derivative of u to the negative 1 with respect to u, that's negative u to the negative 2. And then we simplify a bit. And finally, we get the quotient rule we all know and love. We just multiply the first fraction by a fancy one, which would be g of x over g of x, and then combine the fractions. There we go, low d high minus high d low over low squared. That's the quotient rule. Now, in a college course, this is where the professor would be talking about linear approximation and maybe even Newton's method for approximating things. However, we will delay that until the approximation section. Part of the reason is because it's more fun to talk about linear approximation in the, context of, in the context of Taylor series. Nonetheless, here's a quick summary. 
the derivative gets you the slope of a line tangent to the function, and then you can use linear things to move that line up to the point where you made a tangent. Linear approximation is where you go along this tangent line and try to predict where the function will be based on that tangent line. Spoiler alert, this is a very bad approximation, and it only gets worse the further along the line you go. We now have big brain rules for any derivative we encounter. So, step right up to a brand new game show of... Find your X. The game show that, now that we think about it, seems a little derivative. We have a reigning champion, the derivative. Let's watch as it battles against the toughest of functions. Our first contestant, sine of x squared. Oh, toasted with the chain rule. Let's see a tougher function. Coming into the ring, x cubed minus 3x squared plus 5x minus pi all to the 100th. It's got pi in there. Can the derivative take it down? Oh, it didn't even break a sweat. Let's go even stronger. E to the E to the E to the X. Can the derivative climb to the top? Of course it can. Chain rule doesn't work the first time. Just try it again. Let's now put the derivative up against the strongest opponent yet. X squared plus Y squared equals 1. And it found X squared. OMG, derivative is unstoppable. Now it just finds the X and Y squared and... Wait, there's no x and y squared. Uh, now what do we do? Tune in next episode to see how we resolve this situation.